Welcome in everyone, it's great to see you folks. So I'll, I'll say it once again. There's currently the art book making its rounds, even though the book is supposed to come out on Monday, April 1st. <laughs> there are some really juicy information flowing around. Um, I don't see any chat in the live stream. Wait a sec. Let me refresh again and then switch the scene. Does it reappear? It doesn't. Why? Okay, yeah, but let me continue here what I said before. So let me talk about it a bit, all right? Maybe we can also leave the barracks to have a nicer background. Also, welcome him all with heart. Crazy how Takahashi keeps on surprising us with what he is and what <laughs> this man has been cooking, all right? And not just a little bit. That is genuinely fascinating. Also, on a little side note, I've been recording. I I've recorded this game yesterday for a long time. As a matter of fact, I can be really determined. If I want to do something, <laughs> I'll do it. And I uh, pretty much created a second account on here and played through the entire story again. Which was, yeah, that was something. And then at the end, we received the art book info. And I was kind of broken there <laughs> at the end. So let me go through the infos. <clears throat> One after another, I'm gonna read them and then give my two cents on that. Okay, so Black Fog. Here's a quote from Takahashi, who said that um, the first thing that can be answered, I believe, is regarding the Black Fog. Basically, it's a sign that the worlds of 1 and 2 are approaching each other. Those signs are appearing in another world, the opposite world. For example, in Zeal by Definitive Edition, the Fog King appears on Shulk's side. Looking at it from a different perspective, a similar phenomenon was occurring on Rex's side. I don't know if I just heard that for... I've been told that, but I don't know if it's official or not, or if it was in the art book. But there was a future connected scenario planned for the second game? But it was scrapped? But yeah, so something that we saw in Future Connected has been happening also in the world of all rest. And just that this was portrayed in Xenoblade 2, I believe there was a monster called the Infernal Guldo, which of course we know that was the final boss of Future Connected. <clears throat> the Fog King. Um, he also then later says that the ID card that this boss drops, where we all kind of thought that this would be Galea, it is not Galea. <laughs> it's just a regular woman. I was one of those believer that thought that it, that is Galea, but it seems no, this is just an ordinary woman. Also, I would like to keep it now spoiler three regards to Xenoblade Cross, just for the video's sake, but I, I think I'll also include then a, a second half of the video where I come to also possible connections to this game. Um, also, Lance is a Machina. I think that was pretty self-explanatory, or it was kind of obvious, but he just said that, confirmed it pretty much. Um, Takahashi says about the survey, regarding most quest questions that were written in the survey, almost all of them have proper answers. However, <laughs> I'm just not answering them now since I don't think it's necessary at this point. So for those sorts of things, well, if Monolith Soft is fortunate enough to continue creating things in the future, then I think we will be able to answer it at a certain point. For example, I understand that there are many question, uh, many requests to see what happens after the ending. However, if we were able to do that, we would have to make what lies further beyond from Resident Blade 3. So, uh, I understand the sentiment, but please hold for a bit. If you can look forward to it and wait, that would be appreciated. <laughs> Is that so, Mr. Takahashi? Uh, the possibilities, they just keep on growing. Also, next point. It, it, it will just keep on getting better, I promise. Regarding the admin of origin, uh, regarding the world of Ionios, or rather the way Origin works, there is a proper reason for it. To put it simply, the administrator of that world could do anything, and in the main story of Xenoblade 3, that was Zed. 
That's the story, yes? For the villains of Xenoblade 3, Takahashi says, I wanted to change a bit how the villains were portrayed. For example, in Xenoblade and Xenoblade 2, the villains had their own pride or their own principles. It could be a philosophy or even faith, but the villains had their own sense of justice. But for Xenoblade 3, I had a bit of... What I what if I brought the enemies closer to reality in terms of what is reality? Let's say, for example, those in positions of power, saying people in positions of power are villains, is, well, a bit of a dangerous way to put it. But let's just say, as an example, in real life society, they are the system. As Zed says, they can decide on a system, and they can run it. Even for those people in positions of power, I'm sure they have a life story, social ties and such, but what we can see at the surface, what we can feel is their roots. Most of that is, how should I say this, a desire. A desire for control, money, fame, and maybe, very rarely, lust. Was there a Mobius that lusted? <laughs> I don't... I don't remember that. That's where it tends to be rooted in and occasionally some unsavory people show themselves. What if those people were the villains? So the villains, this time around, are the Mobius, and for them, I wanted to make them villains you couldn't sympathize with by exaggerating their the unsavorness and patheticness that real-life humans have. So what Takahashi is pretty much saying is, uh, you know, Mobius, <laughs> they are kind of like the leaders of our world, which is kind of a wild thing to say, right? I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I get it. Like, I kind of get can get behind that. He also then added, I believe there is a scene where X, uh, X, where Z says, it's because it amuses me. But that line, it could be, it's because three star restaurants taste delectable. Or it's because I love to make money. The line can be whatever. We place the Mobius in that position as a representation of that unsavory aspect of reality. Is there anything we can add to that, really? <laughs> but going over to the next point, and... Man, this is... <laughs> this is something. I mean, we had a theory on that. But he just outright states that... Commenting on End's sword. What's inside the sword of the End that End holds, that would be Logos. I mean, it's Malos. But Malos, for the time being, is dead. Or has disappeared. As to why Malos is there, I'm sorry about this, but I can't answer that at this point. But when N is holding, there is Malos himself. What do you mean, at this point you can't answer that? At this point he can't answer that. Is he, is he stating that Malos will return for Xenoblade 4? What if the protagonist of Xenoblade 4 is Mithra's child with Malos as his blade? <laughs> um, then, regarding Matthew's gauntlet. The fists of the end. Pneuma is inside there, and therefore both Pyra and Mithra. You can think of it as both of their wills being present within the gauntlet. And also, regarding Lucky 7, this is probably the info that got thrown around the most. Lucky 7, which Noah came to wield, and I quote, this is actually, uh, this is not mentioned within the story, but Fiora is inside it. And fr from what I've heard, Lucky 7, it is a reference to the fans, you know, as an anti-spoiler measure, calling Fiora 7. And also, I think Ryan was mentioned that he ended up being just a simple origin shard, because people can also turn out as objects in Ionios. Which means that Rhine is a origin shard. Fiora is lucky seven. <laughs> Pyra and Mithra are in the fists of the end of the gauntlet from Matthew. Like Noah was wielding Fiora. He wielded the wives from the first two games protagonists. And then this man took that sword and yeeted it 
into the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah, um, it seems that in the English translation, uh, it seems that they refer to multiple people, because I also discussed it with some other Xeno folks, that Rico very clearly said that everyone is right here with us. But it seems that's a, a mistranslation, he meant a single person, or a very dear person to the character. I don't know, man, that is... that is something. In regards to the above statement about Lucky7, nobody that was present for the interview seemed to be aware of, <laughs> of this information. Well, that is so funny to me, I don't know. And this statement caused a bit of a stir, with all of them simply asking in response, Fiora? This man is not even sharing this info with his co-workers and such. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Or, or wait, does it make sense? I mean, Riku, we'll come to that also in a bit. This sly freaking Nopon, he was lying to us, and not only once. He was lying to us multiple times. This Nopon, I swear, I have written it down in my notes. I, I, I'm not sure if it'll come here in the oops official translation. Um, but let me just open my notes. He told this story at the very beginning of 3. So yeah, he talks about that story saying Sovon, uh, Sovon. <laughs> 7 Nopon swordsmiths hammered it out of 7 types of white steel over a period of 7 years. And Takahashi himself said, well yeah, that is just a convenient lie that he told us. He knows exactly what he was doing. Melia pretty much told him, Hey, here's Fiora, give it to someone who's worthy in the future. He said, yeah, got it. No worries. He's, oh, unironically, he seems almost like the Mobius of Call Me Nine, you know, who was overlooking things. And <laughs> I don't, all of that is so wild, dude. <laughs> ah, yes, it is what it is, right? Um, Takahashi responds to that after he's been asked about is that even fine <laughs> that he threw that sword into the ocean. This conversation, how do I put this? It deals with the fundamental aspect of origin. Origin and Ionios, you can think of it broadly as a virtual world. Think of it like a server in a virtual world. It actually isn't the case, but this will be fine for demonstration purposes. And then he laughs. He was probably smirking or and smiling the whole time when he did that interview. He, he's playing with us at this point. Um, and within that, there's source code that's running. And as a way to express that, it takes, it can take the form of a system. No, ach, jumping uh, sentences here. It can take the form of a sword. There you go but also not, and Alvis was responsible for the general management of origin system. As the administrator, well Alvis in this case, was quietly watching for a while after origin started up. As this was happening, Zed, a partial administrator and collective conscious-like entity, starts doing things on its own. The story of Future Redeemed starts when Alvis deems this un unacceptable. So Alvis was just, was just standing there watching over everything. Zed wanted to play around and Alvis got mad at him. And then it ended up like that, <laughs> in Future Redeemed. Continuing, he states, many things happen after that, but Alvis, note who he's talking about specifically is not named, but I assume Alvis or more specifically A, okay, ends up sliding siding with Shulk and Co. So there was a, no longer a general admin. And so Zed replaced that position and that's why Zed can mess with the source code, making the human lifespan 10 years and observing it because it's amusing. And things like that. Although the whole 10 year lifespan thing was a change made to the code prior to Future Redeemed. Basically, you can do a lot of things. You can be brazen about it 
when thinking about what can be done to break that source code, this is where you use external powers. I believe this was stated in the story, but a kind of power that exists outside the flow will be necessary, which is interesting to say the least. Um, in regards to what the power would be, it can be the power of the will of young people living in this world, and regardless of Pneuma or Logos, it's the same kind of entity as Elvis, and thus an external factor from Zed's point of view. Therefore, combining these powers and retaking the world for ourselves, that would be the broad explanation of origin-related things. Also, he mentioned that the city people, even though they weren't... Well, that was a discussion we had also, right? That... What about the city people? Because they... came to life pretty much d during this whole Ionios thing. Technically, they shouldn't exist if everything goes back normal, right? If the world fuses together. But it seems, thanks to the will of Noah, his will shall be done, and it seems that they will be born normally in the new world. So we will also see Monica and Gondor and all of them in the new world. He goes on to say that Noah and his friends are fighting for a world in which they, city people, can be properly born. But I will leave this part as a paraphrase for now. Takahashi says that through the lens of Nietzsche, Noah is, as a character can be understood to be an Übermensch that rejects nihilism. Nihilism, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Takahashi says on Riku, Riku, he's sly. He's doing all these things while completely understanding everything that's going on. When he says in the city, Meme, there's something tiny and cute over there. He's saying that on purpose, to bring attention to it, saying, hey look here, there's a really tiny person and look, it's different from you guys, and getting an emotional response out of them, I suppose. He is a bit two-faced, isn't he? His master upon is Melia, so Melia, entrusted, so Melia has entrusted him with what is basically Fiora, and of course, he is also one of and here is a very important thing also, Ricky's son. I've said it from the very start that he is Ricky's son. And I know there were a lot of people who said Kino, but there's one thing that Riku said that still led me to believe that no, it has to be Ricky. Because he said that his father was a long-time companion of Melia, traveling the world and everything. And Kino was, n I mean, maybe it's something that happened after Future Connected, <laughs> I don't know. But if we look at it logically from the two games, the base game and Future Connected, Riki has been way longer with Melia together than Kino. So yeah, that is now also confirmed. Also, yeah, he also says, um, speaking about Riku's explanations about the Lucky Seven and its grandiose origins, Takahashi says those were convenient lies that Riku made up. Quote ends here. This, this man was lying to us constantly, it's... <laughs> it's wild. Like, maybe lying is not always the word that I'm searching for here. But let's just say he left out a lot of relevant infos too. Uh, on the Nopon, he has this to say. In this world, the world of Ionios, Nopon are external entities residing outside of the flow, so they don't have a lifespan. They live forever. Next point also, speaking on, this, on that subject, Kojima knows that some survey responders ask about why Shulk and Rex have lived for such a long time. Oh wait, uh, Takahashi says, Shulk and Rex haven't lived long, have they? Origin is only a recreation of the worlds that used to exist, and if you think of them as being emulated, they should only be able to live what their lifespan is. Shulk and Rex, they defeat Alpha some years after arriving to Ionios, and they shift to sustain the world after that. But how should I say this? Their rank... Their rank is the same as Alva's and the rest of the Trinity processor. 
And this is also true for Melia, Nia and Fiora who wielded Maynath's Monado. In other words, if the admin handles it, anything can be done. If the source code of that world is written as a as a recreation of reality, then if for example the lifespan was set at 8 years old, when they say they can give their lifespans to Glimmer and Nickel, they can, if they rewrite the code. But you normally shouldn't do that, because you don't know what kind of glitches will occur. In Respond A says this is against the rules, and that's sort of the idea there. So... Yeah, did they cheat? <laughs> okay. Let's leave it at that. The next point is also interesting. About the golden modes. He has to say this. Golden modes, that's ascension. Note in the context of death. Yes, dissipation. And it turns to a, into a form that is difficult no, impossible for Zed and the Mobius to use, disappearing to the outside of their systems without being used by the Mobius. Mobius cheat. I mean, I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, Mobius cheat, yeah, but okay. The Liberators cheat. Everyone cheats. <laughs> okay, you know what? I love that explanation. A little. I think that's perfect. Let's keep it at that. Takahashi says that the hooded boy at the end of uh, at the start of chapter 6 is a part of N that resides deep within Noah's psyche. The Takahashi's final comment to wrap the interview up, Xenoblade was released in 2010 and some of our customers have been with us. Okay, yeah, it's just a thanking message now. And uh, well, thank you Takahashi for providing us some peak fiction here. That's all that I can say to that. But it's only like what, a few sides? As far as I know, it's some random dude who went into a shop, saw this book, pre-release, grabbed it, ran into a corner, took some pictures and posted them online. Like, he didn't... he didn't, uh, he didn't even buy the book. <laughs> it's not that expensive now, is it? Might as well could have taken this whole thing with him. Made photos of everything, but... <laughs> what do I know? But yeah, that is the official stuff, the official, well, quote-unquote, official translations. Inofficial official. And here is the thing where I gonna, gotta throw in some stuff from Cross. So if you have nothing to do with Cross, you better leave now. Yeah, that peasant, what, you don't have any money for some books or what? So, Future Connected, right? Future Connected is supposed to connect the future. And if you remember that in one of the, well, earlier chapters of this game, we fought some Tainted at a certain location. Where's this damn location? Why is this location so relevant? I feel like I'm flying to the wrong direction. I'll finish my sentence in a bit. <laughs> Where's that? Come on, don't leave me hanging. So yeah. I mean, it kind of ties in into my theory, my crackpot theory. So we have this Telethia, right? So, of course, it could have been just a neat, um, just Easter egg, you could call it. But the first time we meet him is over there. There you go. And if you notice, this is the only place where fog is present. Black fog. And this is also the first time we meet Telethia. And if you remember from Future Connected, that there were quite a few Telethias that slammed themselves against that black uh, fog portal, whatever that was, you know, on the Bayon shoulder. Actually, let me grab my notes. <laughs> Where we met the fainted, there's black fog. There's also an item, black fog crystal or something that you can find in this game. But yeah, they also mentioned that black fog is only appearing when two worlds are merging. And if you watch the previous stream where I got, well, thanks to JB and also the middle caterpillar who is currently in chat, said that Mira was supposed to be a world out of multiple worlds, like a fusion of multiple worlds. 
which is also one of the reasons why you can see multiple moons at night. Sure, planets can have multiple moons, but for the sake of this theory, let's just say that no, this is definitely one of the reasons. We also have the fact that Lao, when he died, that he turned into those light modes and disappeared somewhere. And Elma said multiple times that there is something about this planet. And you know that sword that Noah threw into the ocean? You know, Fiora Pyramithra? They are now part of the, part of the planet, which later gets fused into Mira. And since Pyra and Mithra are an Aegis that can store data of the whole world, everyone on New LA is also still alive. <laughs> and even if the data on the life hole still broke, it, it still works. And since the Telethia is called the Endbringer, Malos, who will reappear, will eventually turn into a Telethia. And the Great One that Luxor is mentioning is actually Elvis. And he said that he's missing, we, you know, he, where is he? Well, because we killed him. I added that last part for the sake of including him, but, you know, just to include all of the Aegises. But yes, <laughs> that's my theory. M makes perfect sense, no? Man, I, if there's one thing that we can all agree on, is that Takahashi is cooking, man. In the fourth game, oh, this will be something. Honestly, at this point, I'm even more convinced than ever that Cross is just Xenoblade 10. I, I don't know what to tell you. I think I can also stop the recording here. Maybe I should just say leave a like and subscribe and whatever. I should do that more often. I, I barely never... I never say that really, even though I probably should. Like only 8 or 9% of all of my viewers are subscribed. How? 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 Explain that to me. Could be cooking or burning? Honestly, I have. I have faith in Takahashi. Considering how much I enjoyed every game he has made, and I'm talking about the Blade games here. <laughs> um, yeah. I have faith in him.